There we go. Um, okay. So we're going to, I'm going to start with um, my slides because it helps me stay on track here. So we're going with, oh, wait, we're going to let Catherine in first. Now, this is the piece that's going to be, you let me know if it's working. There's an audience window I'm attempting to share. <laughs> Hi, Catherine. Um, okay, there we go. So you can just see the picture of the screen without the little things at the bottom, right? Yep. Just one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Welcome to uh, my take on shadow shadow work, shadow stuff. Um, and to say it's it's really reclaiming what we've put away, which all of us has done because that's how we got through. And I ha I was thinking my son just um, went for a uh, men's retreat this weekend and he was borrowing my sleeping bag. And it was one of those, it's a really big fluffy one. And he was going to fold it to try to get it into his uh, the, the bag. And I said, no, no, you just stuff that in. You just just keep stuffing it in and he's he couldn't believe that would fit in there and i thought that's a great like shadow metaphor it doesn't seem like that big of a bag but it can sure hold a lot and we've been shoving stuff in there um for a really long time so the job is to be able to take things out and integrate them so we're going to talk a bit about that today and how you might do it we're gonna well here let me go to my next um uh yeah so this is what I was thinking of today was just at the very least to inspire you to get curious about your own shadow and what you've put away and what it might mean for you if you can integrate that. Um, yeah, there's a quote where Carl Jung always says we uh, would say that we were all living in shoes too small for us. So integrating your shadow is how we step into larger shoes. So how might we do that? And what impact might that have for us and the world? Um, and one is becoming more fully ourselves. So we're going to maybe talk about some tools, um, why I think shadow work is important. And I'll also give you some of my own shadow stories. And anyone else who has some is, will be free to uh, share them. So we're going to start with a poem. Uh, this is Donna Markova. One of my favorites and a huge inspiration for me in my own shadow work, really. Uh, I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling or catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until it becomes a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance, to live so that which came to me as seed goes to the next as blossom, and that which came to me as blossom goes on as fruit. Um, that is, yeah, I think I learned that years, this poem years ago, and it motivated me in particular because I didn't want my kids to inherit my unlived life. So we're gonna talk about that also. Carl Jung said, this is Carl Jung's quote, one does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light, but by making the darkness conscious. The latter procedure, however, is disagreeable and therefore not popular. <laughs> so um, I'm inviting you into something that's not that popular. Uh, this is another image I think of um, that I've heard maybe James Hollis talk about um, Carl Jung saying, but basically that what we actually know about ourselves is like the size of a boat, a little boat on a vast sea of our unconscious. And we actually need a fairly healthy ego in order to do the digging into what, what is in our sea of unconscious, because it has the ability to uh, capsize your boat, really. Um, I've sometimes thought that's why some people really can't 
do this kind of work until they've built their container um, more. Because if your boat is leaky or you can't hold the hold what you find in your shadow, it's not really a service to do shadow work, really. The job then would be to get actually your container more solid and build your boat. Uh, you need a, you know, a, a healthy ego to look at what you've put away and to reclaim it. Because some of it, again, to step into shoes that are larger is going to require a bigger version of us. And um, sometimes that can be really threatening to the way we've put ourselves together. So just think of that image that what we actually know is very little. And there's so much more to us that we have yet to uncover um, that we have the privilege of digging into for the rest of our days. So <laughs> there's an inspiration for you. Um, Yes. So we want to both build our container and um, do the work of uncovering what we've put away. So in uh, this model, I'm using, you know, Bill Plotkin's work as well as uh, Carl Jung and the work of various Jungians and is maybe a different version of shadow than you're familiar with. But in this model, um, shadow is not what we know about ourselves and don't like. Uh, you know, the things we're trying to keep hidden or that we wish nobody would find out about us. It's truly the stuff that we have no idea about ourselves. So that's why there's some work in uncovering it and we can follow some threads and some ways that it might reveal itself, but it really is what is unknown. So once you know it, it is not your shadow anymore. Um, so it is what is unknown and we can find it kind of so one of the ways is maybe through the statement um, about something that is, this is absolutely not true of me. I am definitely not that. And um, if anyone accused me of it, I'd adamantly deny it. So uh, maybe if ever you hear yourself saying, I am definitely not that, that's a uh, place to look for a bit of your shadow. So like I said, it's definitely unconscious. It's true of everyone. We all have a shadow. We've all put things away. Uh, it's true. We all have one. And I like the image of, you know, when we're not aware of it, it's like this, um, the long black bag we drag behind us, which was, um, which I think is another great version and or image of that. And you spend the first 20 years of your life shoving stuff in like my sleeping bag analogy and the rest of your life taking things out. But the thing about it is when we're going through life as who we think we are, it's the shadow that we're often, um, whacking people with really other people are experiencing our shadow we just maybe aren't aware of it you can also call it your unlived life so whatever version of us we put together to survive there is a whole bunch of us that we didn't live a, a whole bunch of options of even personality that we didn't live so another way to think of it is our unlived life it especially shows up in our sexuality and our anger because those are the things that um, have been the most mislabeled or mishandled or feared in our culture, in our families, uh, even in ourselves, because both of those contain uh, a bo bodily sensations that we got afraid of. So definitely uh, there's kind of, you know, shadow that is cultural in those particular areas. And then we each have our own individual shadows. Uh, mine's going to be different than yours. Different things are going to trigger me as for you, but we'll have some things that potentially are in common because there's some ways that we, that everyone did it similar ways or especially in sexuality and anger. So if you're someone who thinks, well, I never get angry. I don't really have, um, I just don't feel anger. Then you want to be curious about um, where that might be, where you might've put that away. And same with sexuality, since it's a core uh, emotion, also our sexual excitement, we wanna be curious about what we've done with that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so let's go on to the next one here. Here's a quote from James Hollis. I'll give you some books at the end, but this is one of James Hollis's um, quotes. Our adaptive responses to external demands often lead to progressive self-estrangement. How many of us, arriving at midlife or later, having done all the right things, having served the expectations of our family and our tribe, feel so little at home in our lives? 
All that unlived life is now part of the personal shadow. That which one learned to keep at bay since its expression might prove costly to one's necessary adaptations, the shadow. In this case, the unlived life, it goes underground and seeks expression through invasions of affect, like a depression, for example, a precipitous action soon regretted, troubling dreams, a physical ailment, or psychic enervation, which is fatigue or being drained of energy. These adaptations require such a progressive diminishment of personal authority to the point that we often cease to know who we are apart from our roles, our history. We lose contact with what we desire and become strangers to ourselves. So I don't know uh, who's feeling familiar with that, but um, there's a huge cost to what we've put away to not living all of ourselves. But um, yeah, it was co it's costly. Um, so this is an image I've been thinking about lately. The energies of the shadow do not go away; they always go somewhere. From James Hollis. So this is my this is how I see this: is is we have a version of ourselves that we think is true, and we we um, we want to get we put people around us or we have um, mirrors around us that will reflect back to us what we want to believe is true of us. But in reality, we're something quite different. So um, this guy, you know, I'm imagining it like this. He looks like a little bit scruffy, but he wants to be seen as the businessman. So you surround yourself with people who would mirror that back to you. But in reality, you feel very different. Um, so I think of that as, you know, we want to be seen as the good girl, for instance because we're afraid of what else we might have put away that might be contrary to that. And so we might surround ourselves with people who will confirm the version of ourselves that we want to be true, but it's not actually true ne necessarily, most likely. And we're much bigger than that. And so um, that's where the problem comes because we, we've we built a life based on um, wanting to be seen a certain way. And then that starts to come down and we have... Um, reactions to that and so do other people so it could be that the image you want is yeah good girl good boy loyal son uh that you're really nice caring a helper or you could even have it as a don't mess with me i'm really tough um because you want people to mirror that back to you so think about the people that are in your life the relationships you have and how they might be mirroring you and that there may be more to you than what meets the eye so the basic premise is we did what we had to do to survive at great cost to ourselves, like James Hollis calls them, There's our, there are necessary adaptations. I was thinking of it as, um, you know, at, like plants that bend toward the light. We had to bend ourselves toward the light. And even if the light wasn't that effective or wasn't that bright or wasn't that nurturing, if that's all you had as a kid, you needed to align yourself with where that was coming from. So um, here's another thing James Hollis says, even so, none of us would survive without considerable capacity for adaptation. Our adaptations lead us to take on the hues, the values, and the reflexes of the environment, and to internalize the messages of family dynamics and cultural milieu. With each adaptation in service to survival or getting our needs met, we risk further alienation from our inherent nature. This is the origin of the shadow problem. We become our ad adaptations. So then fast forward in life, we've become this version of ourselves that had to aim for a particular form of sunlight, a particular something to get some of our needs met, but at great, great cost to whatever else might have wanted to grow in us. And it is my personal experience that the version of ourselves that's more authentic and true is actually quite different um, than the one, at least for me, than the one I created myself to be. So, but it makes sense if the only way I could survive is to aim myself toward that particular form of sunlight and to put all the rest of it in the long black bag I dragged behind me. Uh, it makes sense that in order to survive, I would have needed to do that. And then my job is to uncover what else I need at this point to grow, to become more fully myself, 
and to uh, separate myself from just living in that child's story. So um, one of the best ways to find places that you have put your shadow, um, this is one of the biggest ways to find it, I think, is uh, in the way that we project our unlived life out. So we've got a couple options here. They are our golden and our sinister projections. Um, we talked about this a bit in the Wild Mind course that some of you were on, so um, this will be some review. But so we want to kind of look at these two options. When so when you meet someone and you have an immediate charge and you think your this charge could go either way, it could be that oh my god, I could never be like that person. I could never speak that way or do that or look like that or be that kind of person. Now we're looking at our golden shadow that we have actually uh, projected onto that person. And there is some resource or something in that, some gold, that if we can find it and integrate it in ourselves, that projection will fall away and we will be, uh, we will be enriched and larger um, because of it. So we want to take those people, this is why, you know, letting yourself explore who you're envious of or jealous of, those are really great places to find shadow. Um, so whenever we say, I could never be like that person, that's a cue that we actually perhaps could be that person, but there's something really threatening about becoming that version of ourselves. And so we've shut it down. And that could be where some of our work is. And the other one is our sinister projections when we say, thank God, I'm not like that guy. Um, or, you know, the classic when you're in a group kind of setting and the first person that really irritates you is a person who uh, seems like they take up all the air in the room or they're constantly talking or they, um, you know, they have no problem sharing their uh, opinions and, but it seems like they're really aggressive or really arrogant. And so you say, well, thank God I'm not like that. And our task in shadow work is to pay attention to those moments too, where we um, think that we're not like somebody. And then we might ask ourselves, how am I actually like that? That's the first kind of layer. How am I actually like that? And I'm telling myself something different. How am I also being um, showing up like that in some way? Uh, or how am I wishing I could, but I'm not? Um, so, and we want to ask ourselves, what at the root of that, we want to ask ourselves, what's the resource that that person has that enables them to do that? And I'll, I'm, I'll give you a, a personal example when we... Um, maybe at the end of my slide, so we can kind of talk about how that might really look with actual person. <laughs> but that's the curiosity. So somebody that really um, irritates you or somebody that you just are really drawn to, those are great places to look for some hidden shadow. Um, and places where we mislabel, which we can also talk about. Um, we might call that person arrogant, but in fact, they're actually just really direct. And we might need that skill of directness but because that scares the shit out of us, because we'd have to become more direct, we'll label it as arrogant and then we don't have to look there. We'd be like, oh, that person, we can write that off and we don't have to do that work of integrating that. So those are two really important places to look. And the other is the area of transference um, where we have put our unfinished relational business onto other others or other relational dynamics. So this is um, this particular, I noticed this for myself uh, in my really long marriage, realizing that I married my mom and had unfinished work to do in that relationship uh, around that area. So um, these can be where we've had some incomplete dynamic from childhood and part of the shadow work is to discover it and then to complete the task that we weren't able to do um, as kids. So, and that can be scary too, because what if that's standing up to that kind of person or um, trying to get your needs met? Or what if that's, you know, in my case, like if I'm trying to rescue uh, my mom, what if growth for me is I have to stop doing that and I don't get to get my needs met that way, or I have to let go of those relationships where I'm doing that. Um, that's something I could have never done as a kid. And because it's still a it's still hard work as an adult. 
but part of my work of finishing my childhood tasks. So definitely something I had to, I've had to do. So here's a little bit more of um, some ways that we work with it. And I think I would really love to inspire you just to be curious, really, about, you know, we all know, we know we have one. So we've established that we all have a shadow. So what's in it? What have I put away? What was too risky for me to live? Um, that's, I think, a starting place, you know, be curious. Pay attention to when you have a strong um, emotional reaction that does not fit the circumstance. So you've really blown up or you've gotten really sad and stuck somewhere and the situation does not seem to warrant the response that you had. Also a great place to look for shadow because something in us has gotten activated and um, we don't necessarily know what it is. So we want to be curious about our emotional reactions to things. We want to look at, like I said, who we're really drawn to. And again, that could be in relationships that we've surrounded ourselves with. Who, who are you? Who are your friends? Who are you drawn to? Who are you repelled by? Um, and then asking ourselves, how am I also like that? Number one. And then looking at our, what resource does that person have? And that's the goal in it. If you can find the resource that enables them to do that and integrate that yourself, that person will become less irritating to you. And that's um, part of the work. I often think like, what's the point unless it actually impacts your daily life? What's the point of doing it if it doesn't make a difference? And it really truly does make a difference to integrate that stuff. And then when those projections fall away, you can either be in relationship with that person or choose not to. Um, and, or they don't, they don't elicit the same response in you. So you're not as drawn to them. Uh, you're able to see other facets maybe that they have that you don't like, or you are able to be in relationship with them and not aren't as irritated. So it does expand our capacity to show up in life. And personally, for me, I think that's the point. So um, we can also pay attention to what it is our kids are expressing that is from our shadow or that they're calling us on in ourselves. So what do, what do we hear our family members say that we might want to pay attention to? Uh, Richard Rohr had, has said, you know, if we can sometimes assume that even if we assume that just 10% is true, we can get curious about that. Even if, you know, it's not all true, what part of it is, what are, what have I asked my kids to hold that is not theirs and it's actually mine. Uh, that's a, I think of also the shadow work as, uh, if we have, if you look at it like having little tendrils and all your tendrils are um, attached to other people and we're getting some, we're siphoning off some energy, we're getting some of our needs met through that. To me, this, the healing work and shadow work is about um, pulling back those tendrils. So I'm not, so I'm not getting, I'm not sucking the life out of <laughs> other people, especially my kids. I'm not taking, um, taking from them. So I'm, I'm live I'm committed to living my own life as fully as I can so that I don't have to get them to do it. So if I, you know, if I'm stepping into, let's say my, um, well, even in this case, stepping into being my teacher, I might be able to pull that off my kids so that my kids don't have to be stuck in some aspect of my shadow, um, you know, instead of living their own life. So if you have questions about that, we can talk about that after also. Um, definitely pay attention to your dreams. A great way that your uh, shadow will show up is in your dreams and you will find um, elements of it too in those kind of same sentences. I'm definitely not that. So they can be the same. You're repelled by something in your dream or you've got some crazy figure doing all this destructive stuff and you'd say, you would say, I'm, I would never be like that. So then we want to get curious uh, if I've mislabeled that in my dream and I maybe need the resource that that one has and or maybe I am like that and I'm not owning it. So dreams can definitely show you some great uh, places. Um, yeah, I just don't think what I want to say about that. Um, I remember one um, 
just quickly once one somebody I was working with asked me the question that I had posed about myself that she said are you still getting in your own way and I said no I'm not but you know I think I'm I'm not doing that anymore and that night I had this dream of being in this little bookstore and um the the I was turned and faced the facing the bookshelves putting books away and when I looked to my left there was this big line of people that couldn't get by me <laughs> and it was one of the only ones that I've kind of had this, oh, I get it when I get up in the morning, but it felt like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm actually still in, in my own way. And I'm in the way of all these <laughs> versions of myself who are trying to get by. So it kind of, um, made me wake up to, oh no, I'm still doing that. And there's some shadowy pieces of it. Cause I was not aware of it. So pay attention to your dreams. Um, also pay attention to if you, when you're tired and things that slip out or when, you, you know, if you're someone who gets drunk, this is my kids really <laughs> pay attention to what comes out when you're drunk or the ways that you can act because now you have alcohol and all of a sudden you're this kind of person, you might want to pay attention to how that's showing up. Um, yeah, or otherwise under the influence, like what are we accessing when our defenses are down? that might actually want more conscious participation. So, and also pay attention to the more than humans that you are drawn to or repelled by. The animals, the creatures, the plants that you love and the ones that you hope to never ever run into. And what, um, I've done some shadow work around snakes that way for myself, around what kind of, um, what is it about them that really I'm afraid of and how, and for me, that was working with how this, how snake makes people uncomfortable. You have a really strong reaction to a snake. You either love them or you hate them. Um, and so kind of working with that, you know, what is it about that? Uh, that is the resource that I might need. And so I did, I came to the kind of awareness that I needed to be more willing to make people uncomfortable, to let people have a reaction of me. That would be you either really love her or you hate her. Um, and that that was the medicine that snake was offering me. So that's how that, again, that's a, also was a dream for me. So dream work and then doing some shadow work around that can really expand you. Um, one other Bill Plotkin would say, bring your uh, shadow closer. So if there's someone that really irritates you and you think, oh my God, thank God I'm not like them. One way that you could be doing your own work around it is to bring that shadow closer, spend a little bit more time, at least consciously um, being curious about them or even in their presence with the intention of being uh, doing your own work, seeing what comes up for you. So bring your shadow closer. Uh, complete your old relationships. Do what you couldn't do when you were young. Do the tasks that are being asked of you. Uh, to show up more fully in your life. This is a, can be a tough one, and it's actually really important. There's the healing week work we need to do, but there's also developmental tasks, stuff that we couldn't do when we were young that mystery is inviting us to complete now. So ways that we couldn't step out because it was too risky, that we're being invited to take the risk in our adult um, relationships. So be aware of where you might have been stuck in relationships or what kind of things were not allowed in your family or ways that you couldn't be with your parents or couldn't say things and how that might be uh, being in, asked of you in your adult world to complete those tasks in the relationships you're now in. So if it's rescuing, how are you gonna not rescue and let people have their experience and you don't do anything to fix it? So that can be a difficult thing to do. Um, and then the piece of owning, you know, the other thing is we're uncovering things that we've put away for a reason. They're too risky. And some of them can actually be things that we uh, we would not like about ourselves, admitting things that we don't, we think are, would make us unlovable. And so can we be the person that loves what we find? As you pull things out of that black bag you drag behind you, can you be the person who doesn't turn away and actually still loves what you find, even if it needs a little growing or, you know, once it sees the light, maybe it takes shape differently. But can you be the one who doesn't turn away from the monsters in your own closet and is willing to integrate 
these um, seemingly unlovable places in us. If we don't do it, no one will. So can we turn toward our shadow? Can we take things out of there as we meet them? And can we lovingly hold them to ourselves and integrate them? That's the task of the loving adult, I think. Um, and then step into those larger shoes. Um, like I said, look at your relationships. Uh, James Hollis would ask the question, like, what are we asking the other to do for us that we need to do for ourselves? So what am I asking my kids to do for me that I need to do for myself? If I'm asking them to carry some bigger dream of mine because I wasn't willing to live it, um, wh what expectation do I have of them? And can I pull that in and do it myself instead? If I integrate that and step into that, my kids won't have to do it. Same with relationships. What am I asking the other to do for me that I need to do for myself? What have I asked you to carry that is actually my task? So, and then a, the question to always stay with is what resource does that one have that I might need? So it doesn't mean that that person that you're triggered by isn't a jerk. So we're not, you know, I'm not saying that that person doesn't have those qualities. But there's something in the looking for the resource that that person has that enables them to be a jerk that you might need. Um, and in its, you know, healthier form, but to be curious about that, like what is the resource that enables that person to do what they do? Um, this is uh, Carl Jung again, but the greatest burden on a child is the unlived life of the parent. As children, we will be forced to repeat the pattern, overcompensate for it, or try to figure out a treatment plan for someone else's personal shadow. So it's a lot of, that's partly why I think for a lot of us, we've, at least for me, I felt like I have, I have not just my healing to do, but I have always felt like, and I'm having to do my parents' work as well. And I think that's been true because they did not take on the tasks that were being asked of them really. So it does fall to someone else to do it. So the more that we can do what's being asked of us and do our own uncovering, the less our kids will be asked to carry. So at least for me, it's like, I will not die an unlived life. I will be committed to um, unpacking as much as I can and living it as fully as I can and showing up for the tasks that are being asked of me. And it won't be a perfect process, but it will be um, what James Hollis would say, just makes your life more interesting. So it <laughs> makes us interesting, makes our relationships interesting. Um, and it in, we just increase our capacity to show up for our own lives. So this is kind of my summing up here, and then we'll do some personal stories, but that shadow is not what you don't like about yourself and keep hidden. It's actually what is true about you. And if you're accused of it, you would adamantly deny it. That's Bill Plotkin's take on shadow. Uh, once you know it, it's not in your shadow anymore. Uh, it contains a gift, a resource. There's gold in that shadow. Uh, it holds a lot of energy. So the image I would have for that is, you know, holding a ball underwater. And when you're holding a ball underwater, you, it's going to come out eventually somewhere. So it takes a lot of energy to, um, hold our shadow back to keep that stuff in the bag and to lug it around. So as you integrate things from your shadow, you will have more energy. That's true. Uh, cause less is going into maintaining this separation or keeping this stuff hidden. And so there's more of you available to live. And since I haven't actually really spoken about this, but also body is where we shove it, a lot of it. So we metaphorically have the bl long black bag we drag behind us, but it's actually going to show up in our actual body. It can show up as sickness or tensions or body breakdown. So as we uncover that stuff, we are going to have more space in our body, less um you know, less breakdown, really, and more of us will be present. There's just more open heartedness. So it's important work. And to remind you that um, 
we're not really covering that this time, but, you know, to just remind you about wholeness, that we need to be in our whole selves to work with our shadow. We need to be our healthy adult and integrate what we've put away. We need to, you know, uh, fish for those things that in our shot are in our shadow, but we want to be in our healthy adult to do it. We don't want our young child parts trying to get stuff out of our shadow because they will be overwhelmed by it but your healthy adult can absolutely find hold what it finds. So um, just to say that this and our, what's in our shadow will make our regular ego consciousness uncomfortable. So we have like the boat floating on the ocean. We have this certain way of seeing ourselves. We have our, our health, our ego that we know of uh, the integrating of the shadow will make that one of you uncomfortable. So tolerating discomfort is part of the expanding that we now as adults can afford to be more uncomfortable than we could as kids. So just to remember that it's going to be uncomfortable. And it is the storehouse of everything that I consider not me and everything my family said could not be me as well. So if there was only certain ways of being that your family accepted, the rest of it is in the shadow. Um, eventually also let's just name that our shadow, if we don't do that kind of work of uncovering it, our shadow can turn on us just like any animal that you, um, tie up and leave and don't treat very nicely. It can turn on you and get a little feral. And so shadow can do that. And people can be overwhelmed by their shadow. And I mean, we experience it all the time in the world where people's shadow takes over. And that's the, you know, the story of the, um, especially I just think of church stories where, you know, the pastor who's speaks about or spoken about um, sexual sin goes out and commits some, you know, like you can have, you can be overwhelmed by your shadow. So we want to integrate it. We want to stop projecting it on other people, like those kind of people who do that kind of thing. And we want to own it and live, um, live it as fully as we can. So yeah, we'll ask other people to carry it, carry it. Um, so here's some resources for you to go deeper. Of course, James Hollis has lots, has written lots on the shadow in particular, why good people do bad things is a book on the shadow. Robert Bly, he's the one who coined the black, long black bag we drag behind us. A little book on the human shadow. Actually, I didn't totally look that up, but I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. <laughs> but, and Robert A. Johnson, Owning Your Shadow, Bill Plotkin, of course. Marion Woodman and really any of the Jungian analysts there. Um, Carl Jung is the one who coined the, the idea of the shadow. So they are for sure experts in um, that kind of work, I think. So anyway, and just a few things that I'm thinking of for the future. I want to do some a dream work webinar and um, I'm really also wanting to do a sacred rage webinar working with emotions um, and maybe a shadow day long where we could do a little bit more um, actually go on a wander like that you're actually invited to go out and uh, encounter some of your shadow. That's a great way to also do it, to get out there and um, meet your shadow outside, go have a conversation with a shadow in nature and see what you learn. So that's it for my slides. Here's a little, in case you're watching this later and then I'm gonna stop sharing and we're going to um did that stop <laughs> did it are we all okay let's go okay so I wanted to do and I'm gonna invite any uh, anyone else with shadow stories um so here's a couple where I discovered some of mine and not that there's not more than a couple of stories there is, but here's one. And you may have heard this, but I was on a body work um, trainings. And when we would go to do these, we would spend like eight days in the, in a house together. And so it was really, a lot of your stuff is coming up. And anyway, I, and the instructors lived there too. So I had this one instructor who I really like, and she was going to do something. And I made a joke to her, um, which I was trying to be funny. So I, anyway, I made this joke and later she comes to me and says, you know, that was seemed really kind of harsh. I just want to know if there's anything 
about that, that you wanted me to know or whatever. And I, I was like, oh my God, <laughs> no, I totally, I meant to be funny. I'm so sorry if it hurt you. And Bill Plotkin always says, you will, uh, you'll know it's your shadow because you will adamantly and sincerely deny that it's true of you. And I, I remember after thinking, oh my God, I really adamantly and sincerely denied that that was true of me. <laughs> and I just really was like, no, no, I never, I would never want to do that. I'm so sorry. Um, and she was like, oh, you know, we worked it out. It was very nice. And I went back to my room and I immediately had these thoughts of, well, that's it. I'm never going to try to be funny again. I can't believe that. And just this whole, you know, my whole little inner talk. And I, so my, my first thought was, oh my God, there's something there. <laughs> like, I'm, oh, she's right. I really did. And it, it, it didn't even take more than just, just acknowledging that there was something there brought the, oh, I'm actually angry. I'm angry. And I had been angry when I went into that intensive. I was angry that they didn't um, incorporate actually some parts work. And I felt like there's some things missing, but I didn't address that. I Anyway, so I passive aggressively made a joke. And so I went back and got her and I said, uh, you're right. I really did mean that. That was on purpose. And and uh, so we we had a great conversation about it. And she, of course, was great to make space for me to own and I got honest about what I really did think. And, um, but I, I really, it was one of those moments of, oh my God, if I'm not direct, I will definitely be passive aggressive. <laughs> and then I, I got more curious about where else that shows up. And I, I do know that to be true of me now. So no longer shadow, but I will be passive aggressive if I don't nail that on the head. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it's one of those kind of things, but I think what makes shadow tricky is that then the invitation is to, Im to embody that, to do it differently, to go get that instructor and humble yourself and say, I did that on purpose. I was actually being mean and, um, and then owning what I was angry about and all those things I would never have done. Like I, I, and again, it reminds me of like the mirror. I want to be seen a certain way, not as an angry person who has issues with these things or who wants to create, make waves. You know, I want to be seen a certain way. So, um, yeah, so that was one big, uh, big shadow thing for me. Um, what's another one? Oh, another one is working with someone. So in the process of, um, looking at someone who really irritates you, uh, was kind of an experience like that. in some of my trainings where there's that one person that you think, oh my God, I can't believe they said that. And, you know, I would never say anything like that. And in watching, so I knew, I mean, I was at a shadow intensive also. So that's the purpose is to really get curious about who's irritating you. So I, I took this person and I thought, okay, like, what is she doing? And what does she have that makes her do that? That she can just go into the circle and say a whole bunch of dumb shit and not worry about it. That's how I'm framing it. <laughs> that's not how she probably thought of it, but that's how I thought of it. And so I, um, I looked at like, how does she, how is she doing that? And I realized it was partly that she's, well, I would have framed it like she's aggressive. She's just really aggressive. And she, she's willing to take up all the air in the room. And, but I think I, so my own insides would frame that aggressive because then I would never look at that as a resource that I might need. Like I would never want to be aggressive. So what, what could she possibly have for me? But then when I realized, really, I think she's actually direct and I don't want to be that direct as per my previous story. <laughs> I don't want to be that direct and I don't want to look stupid. And she's willing to look stupid and just say shit. And I, I thought, okay, like I, I need, there's something I need here that she has. And what was fascinating about that was doing that work around that actually really did enable me to, we work together. I've held space with her. It's been really great. I can still see the things I still saw there, but I have no desire to do anything about them. I don't need to fix that for her. I can let her be her own self. And I can appreciate that I might sometimes need to channel my inner that. <laughs> and I might need to say those things and be willing to risk myself. So, and I, yeah. And I feel like that's, that's the point. Like, where can we, where does this work intersect with our own lives? Otherwise, like, who cares if it doesn't actually make you show up fully and, you know, bigger, or you aren't living more of your life, who cares? Don't do it. But I have actually seen it make a difference and integrating that those 
pieces of me or being willing to make people uncomfortable or step out uh, or being committed to living as much of myself as I can so my kids don't have to do it. Those are um, huge motivators to me. So, and also unraveling my marriage when I realized I married my mom, like there's just so many things. <laughs> so, okay, but let's, let's have like whatever um, discussions you want to have around it and any other stories of shadow that would like to be shared. I am open to or any questions you have thoughts yeah oh I didn't know the cat was in here and I can all you know I can make Eileen do it because she will <laughs> So I can share one if you like. Yeah, uh, go for it. I have lots I could share uh, <laughs> in this work. It's, it's terrifying, uh, especially noticing that everything that irritates me about someone else, now I have to think, hmm, maybe that's actually something in me. But another thing James always talks about in his books is he'd like to form a club called Nice Guys Anonymous. Yeah. And I'm sure you could have a Nice Gals Anonymous too but of just being that nice person identity. And that's definitely me. And I'm very triggered. I'm picturing one person in particular, uh, a much bigger guy than me, super opinionated and always willing to just state his opinion and how much he irritated me. But having to realize I'm actually kind of opinionated. <laughs> I just pretend that I'm not. I just pretend that I'm nice. I'm actually probably just as opinionated as he is. And sometimes uh, I do better by saying that opinion. But it seems to always come out messy at first, which is the hard part. Like if, if, if noticing that about myself, I might find myself being angrily sort of sharing my opinion because I'm not used to doing that yet. Or yeah, so it's just always messy. And sort of humbling but mm. but rewarding work yeah that's an example that's not too hard to share <laughs> yeah. yeah i i think it's the building up tolerance of that like being uncomfortable too right and and all your parts going oh my god i can't believe you just said that you just stated your opinion you're just like that guy <laughs> yeah that's great. I often say to myself too, man, if I'm having a hard time as an adult, no wonder I didn't do it as a kid. Like if it takes all I can do to integrate my own shadow now, no wonder I couldn't live that stuff. Of course I wouldn't have done that. Go ahead, Eileen. I'll share one here. Um, the nice guy, good girl. Absolutely. I'm in your camp, you guys, for sure. But what I'll share the story about, um, about the word I can never say condescending. So I made a, some TikToks and about just not even anything controversial. It was like billings or something like this. Like it was just about office management, or whatever, right? Like nothing. Anyway, somebody who didn't even know me wrote and said, well, isn't that just condescending? of you or something like this, right? And I'm like, oh, no, that's not me. I'm not condescending. So I quickly took all those videos down and I was just like, I don't want to be condescending. And then I got angry and I'm like, so what if I'm condescending? And so then I walked in the woods. I'm like, look at me, trees. I'm condescending. See how condescending I am to you? And so I just, really embodied that condescending part of me and I walked and then I could really own it and go yeah some people will absolutely see that part of me is condescending and so what so what if they do they're obviously not my people <laughs> but yeah. really claiming that part where I could be condescending where I could again have an opinion I could have that power it really 
was a different way of approaching it rather than saying, well, I guess I'm never going to share anything out in the world again. I will just keep that, keep, stay small, right? So yes, condescending me. Condescending. <laughs> I'm an asshole. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's, yes. There's, um, uh, there's a practice in animus programs where it's called the Heart Warrior Council and where you sit in front of somebody that you have a really strong projection with. And the purpose is to own yourself back and to do your own work around it. And it is one of the most intense experiences ever. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was what, I mean, I did that sitting in front of Bill Plotkin and owning back my teacher self and my, uh, you know, cause I thought definitely I'm not that. I'm a housewife at the time. It was like, I'm, I am nothing like that. And to own that back for myself. Um, yeah. is the most intimidating kind of process, but then to, yeah, say I am, I can be that, or I am that. Um, anyway, it's one of the, it's a really intimidating practice and it's a really great way of having to own what it is about that person that they have getting to the root of like, what's that thing? What is that? What is that jewel you have that makes you do what you do that I might need? And that is a shifting, that process is real and is expanding and really um, scary to the way we've put ourselves together. Yeah. But now if somebody says you're really condescending, you could be like, yes, I'm. I know. Thank you so much. <laughs> you know, and the in the uh, the Heart Warrior Council, like, no, I've never actually had somebody sit in front of me to say something about me that really irritated them or they were really drawn to, which is kind of an interesting thing, which I also think probably means in those circles, at least when I've done that, I haven't showed up in a way that um, a lot, uh, brought that response out in people. And so if I ever go to one of those things and somebody finally does, my first thing would be, yes, oh my God, I've really irritated somebody. <laughs> I really got, I, I got somebody to have a response of me because my good girl is committed to just kind of the, you know, I don't want you to have too, too much of any kind of response of me. But in reality, we, we actually want to be a little bit more, I think, magnetic than that or repelling for all the best reasons. So I think if somebody actually eventually does, that would be my first. Yes. <laughs> and they won't get why, why, why is she okay with that? Yes. They said I'm condescending. <laughs> yes. Have a moment of being proud of myself for, yeah, not being so middle of the road. Um, yeah. So I think that's what we're avoiding some kind of strong reaction that somebody will have of us. And that bringing stuff out of your shadow makes people respond to you, I think. And it it can, I think, also make you realize, at least for me, it was like, I have made myself to be this version that is actually, it would be like, if I'm on that hill, I realize, oh my God, I'm supposed to be over there. <laughs> I'm on that hill. And I've actually built this one and built my life there, but who I'm meant to be is over here. And I think that's the power of, that expanding what if I'm actually meant to be a lot more like snake than than I am but that scares the shit out of my the way I've put myself together so integrating that is not for the faint of heart especially if we want to just be seen a certain way so any other thoughts or experiences with shadow And the beauty of the golden projection too, is that that means you whatever you're really enamored by, oh, sorry, Jenny, I'll get, I'll just right. finish this and then you go, I'll finish this. Um, is that the, whoever you're drawn to means that that person, that you are also like that, you're just not living it yet. So that means I get to say, oh my God, I'm, I could be, I have that too. If I see it in someone else, it's because it's also in me. I'm just not living it. I wonder what that's about. And that's a cool prospect that I can, that I get to let myself be envious of other people because that's where some of my integration work is. Go ahead, Jenny. 
Um, thanks. I was just going to share um, an experience for me. For me, lately has been around taking up space, and um, it's something that has been really difficult for me. And uh, and reclaiming actually, um, you know, a part of me, like in, in my name, actually in my childhood family name, I'm reclaiming back. Um, some of what it represents and and that name was loud l-o-u-d and I went through my life um, often being called Jenny Quiet uh, and 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 changing my name uh, you know through marriage and things like that so so um, one of the things I've found helpful lately has I've been um, doing this dance embodiment meditation practice and you know, like um, as a child, my mother would sent me off to ballet, and I was just the most un, un, uh, yeah. I was not a small child, so ballet was, was definitely not my thing. But you know, like just kind of like almost giving myself permission to allow my body to to move. Uh, yeah, so that's been something for me that I've been working on lately because of that constriction that I've lived with most of my life, and it's been. Um, yeah, so just kind of, I'm trying to break out of that uh, that shell of of constriction and um, and a allowing my body to take up space. So um, yeah, I don't know if that's helpful, but just wanted to share that. Super helpful. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Thank you. Yeah, how great! And find some people around you that really irritate you with how much space they take up. <laughs> And ask if you can be friends. <laughs> I just want to watch what you see how it is you do what you do. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. So were you going to say anything, Catherine? At the oh, back? I was just going to say that was really inspiring to hear that. I've been thinking about that, too. It's really hard for me to to take up space. Um, and I think just having the perspective of thinking of I mean I don't know it's such a it's just such a perspective shift to think about who is it that I look up to and how do I now um because I think I have a lot of golden shadow so how how can I like you were saying how can I in you know how can that become part of who I am in this moment you know just to be able to speak up about an opinion is you know like that's I don't want people to feel uncomfortable what if my opinion's different than theirs and and then they're, they feel uncomfortable because my opinions, diff, you know, I don't want that, but what if it's okay for them to be uncomfortable with that? And, and just learning how to share small, I don't know, in small ways. Cause obviously it's, it's going to be a challenge, but maybe finding small ways, like going out in the forest, maybe I can share my opinion with, you yes. know, the trees and, and be able to say, this is my opinion. And I, you know, I'm standing on this, you know, I don't have to change because your opinion's different than mine. I, and anyway, so that was really, really good. Thank y'all for sharing. That's a brilliant idea, by the way. And you, I absolutely think you should do that yeah. <laughs> and practice taking up and see what they say. See what they say when you totally step into taking up all that space and then you tell them, and another thing, here's some <laughs> other things I think, <laughs> and here's some more. And you just keep going. And then what would be the response from those ones who are not threatened by you taking up space? Mm -hmm. And what might shift for you if that could be, yeah, if that was possible. And I think that's part of why I love trees too, because they take up space, you know, they take up their strong, they're not going to be moved by other, by even really a storm or, you know, they're, they're, they're strong in their space taking. And yeah. so you know, I think that's really cool. Yeah. So then you could ask them, what's the resource that you have that enables you to do what you do? How is it that you stand there so firmly and you don't, uh, and you don't move, you know, like that. And rather than just, well, they have roots and they just, it goes down deep, <laughs> you know, like let yourself be curious about what, what is it? What's the resource that they have that I also then could um, integrate that would help me stand just like that? Yeah, that's great. And then when you're sitting in one of those circles and somebody says, oh my God, you're so unmovable. I can't believe you don't budge. 
yes <laughs> i've finally done it yeah that's awesome it's great it's yeah it's important work right it's it is expansive and to step into yeah the world needs jenny loud the world needs the Catherine that's willing to stand and state her opinions, right? Like the world needs the fullness of each of us to be as fully ourselves as we can. And when we're dragging a large bag behind us, that's full of all our, some great things We're we're not showing up fully. And the world is missing pieces. So. Well, we Thanks everyone. I it's great. Thanks for letting me do it. And thanks for coming. Thanks for being willing to share some stories and listen to some stories. Thanks, Becky. You're welcome. Thanks, Becky. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being curious about your shadow. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Bye. Bye.